The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. Well, we've been following an interesting trail that leads from the start of democracy in ancient Greece with concepts of human rights to the first historically significant statement of human rights by Cyrus the Great of Persia. Now, Zechariah was living in the time and place where the decree of Cyrus went into effect. And there are four historical giants, Solon, Croesus, Cyrus, and Zechariah, who are linked philosophically, geographically, historically, and I might say spiritually, and they form a continuum. Now, Zechariah's vision of the flying role is Cyrus' Bill of Rights in the language of Zion and is an argument for natural law in two areas, the civil and the sacred. Natural law is law whose content derives naturally from human nature or physical nature and therefore has universal validity. Now, Thomas Hobbes defined natural law as the way in which a rational human being seeking to survive and prosper would act. Well, the Greek philosopher Socrates, who lived 469 to 399 BC, his successor Plato from 424 to 348, and Aristotle 348 to 322, proposed the existence of natural justice or natural rights. And the development of this tradition of natural justice into natural law is attributed to the Stoics, who were a Greek philosophical school founded in the early third century BC, and they were associated with Zeno of Athens. Well, Stoics were concerned with the relationship between cosmic determinism, or what you do is matter of fate, and human freedom. The Stoics were indifferent to the source of this higher law, whether it arose from nature or divinity. And Stoics asserted the universe existed according to a rational and purposeful order, and that the means by which a rational human being lived in accordance with this order was natural law, which dictated actions that accorded with virtue. Now, these theories were highly influential with Roman jurists and played an important role in subsequent legal history. Now, in natural law, jurisprudence, the content of man-made positive law, the law of a given legal community, society, or nation-state, is related to natural law and gets its authority at least in part from its conformity to objective moral standards. Now, natural law can be used as a standard to evaluate man-made law. And natural law theory attempts to define a higher law on the foundation of universal understanding that certain choices in life are good or evil or that certain human actions are right or wrong. In ethical theory, certain choices, actions, or dispositions can be asserted to be inhuman, unnatural, cruel, perverse, or unreasonable from a moral point of view. Now, in political theory, certain policies, proposals, or actions can be construed as violations of human rights. In international jurisprudence, certain actions can be defined as crimes against humanity, whether or not they claim immunity from legal liability or obligation. Now, natural law theories influenced the development of English common law and featured in the philosophies of Thomas Aquinas, Thomas Hobbes, and John Locke. And in the struggles between Parliament and the British monarchy, Parliament often referred to the foundational or to the fundamental laws of England which were declared to have embodied principles of natural law since time immemorial. Now, John Locke thought there were three natural rights. First of all, life. Everyone is entitled to live once they are created. Liberty. Everyone is entitled to do anything they want to do as long as it does not conflict with the first right. And estate. Everyone is entitled to own all they create or gain through gift or trade as long as it does not conflict with the first two rights. Well, the concept of natural rights was incorporated in the United States Declaration of Independence. And Thomas Jefferson echoed John Locke saying, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator 
with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, in the 19th century, the movement to abolish slavery seized on the rights passage of the Declaration of Independence. And future Chief Justice Chase argued before the Supreme Court in the case of John Van Zant, who was charged with violating the Fugitive Slave Act, that, quote, the law of the Creator, which invests every human being with an inalienable title to freedom, cannot be repealed by any interior law or inferior law which asserts this man is property. The argument for and against natural law goes on today in the United States with strangely contrary positions being held by the same side. For example, in recent times, an interesting development is the idea of animal rights upheld by the courts on the one hand, while human rights are being violated on the other. Save the whales, but abort the babies. Now, it is striking that philosophical concepts about natural law and natural rights arose in Greece about 90 years after the Jewish return from Babylon and makes one reflect on Josephus' contention that much Greek philosophy originated from Judaism. And to me, it is, personally, it is intriguing that Zechariah makes the argument for conscience and common sense in Judaism at the beginning of the 70 weeks nation, while the apostle Paul makes the same argument at the end of the 70 weeks nation. That ought to make a Bible student sit up and take notice and wake up. Now, Paul makes his argument in Romans 1 and Romans 10. In Romans 1, Paul acknowledges his debt to Greek and barbarians. Now, what Greeks and barbarians do you suppose he had in mind? Do you think that Paul was unaware of the beginning and end of the 70 weeks nation? Paul declares the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men and states that the invisible things of God, his eternal power and Godhead, can be clearly seen from creation. Therefore, all men are without excuse. At the heart of everything World Missionary Evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries. Right now, we have many native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bibles. That allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. If you would like to either sponsor a native missionary or provide the gift of Bibles, simply call us at 1-800-501-2851. goes on to say that when Gentiles which don't have the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, 
their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts meanwhile accusing or excusing them. Now Paul is arguing natural law as a basis for verdict on all men in the day when God shall judge the secrets of man by Jesus Christ. And in Romans 10, Paul takes up the case of his own people who are ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own. And note, incidentally, that the word righteousness in this passage means legal righteousness. Paul then says that Moses codified the law, but that righteousness by faith doesn't need to ascend the heights or plumb the depths, but it's in your heart and your mouth. Paul is referring to a passage in Deuteronomy 30, 11 through 14, when Moses tells Israel at his departing, for this commandment which I command you this day is not hidden from you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven and bring it down for us that we may hear and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea to some other nation and bring it for us that we may hear and do it. But Paul says, the word is nigh you in your heart and your mouth that you may do it. And Moses goes on to clarify the fact that obedience to the law of God is a heart matter and not a head matter. Thus the basis for divine law and civil law consisting, consisting in natural law is made for Judaism, for Christianity, and for all pagan societies of all time and all place and it is made by Zechariah at the start of the 70 weeks nation and by Paul again at the close of the 70 weeks nation. Now Jesus makes the same point in Luke 12, speaking of the leaven of the Pharisees and the signs of the times. And Jesus said, why even of yourselves can't you judge what is right? Jesus then applies the principle to the relation of the Jews to their Roman adversaries and telling the Jews, warning them about Rome, Paul says, agree with them in the way as you go to the magistrate, lest he hail you to the judge who delivers you to prison from which you won't escape until you pay the last farthing. Now Luke 18 deals with destitute Judah in their condition after they have failed to agree with their Roman adversary and have been delivered to the judge of the earth in their time. Now God assures them of an ultimate hearing before the judge of the universe, but questions whether men will persist in the conviction that certain things ought to naturally be and will continue to try to bring those things into being. Will they persist in their fight for human and natural rights, even though legal rights may be suspended for them by city, state, and local governments? So this is the vision of the flying roll. It is a plea for the sovereignty of natural law, common sense, right intent, and the rule of conscience, as opposed to Zechariah will, what Zechariah will describe in his next vision about nitpicking religious legalism that is trashing the grand vision. Now we continue talking about the great Persian empire, empire builder Cyrus the Great, Zechariah the prophet, the Jewish return from Babylon, Greek philosophers, Jewish prophets, natural law and natural rights, concepts on which the United States of America was founded. And I asked the question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did Judaism affect Greek philosophers or did Greek philosophy just arise on its own? I mentioned a rabbi, Yeshua Sherpin, and a question he asked, quote, is there, or a question he was asked, is there any evidence that Jewish thought and philosophy had an influence on the Greeks? Here's his answer, quote, in contemplating your question, I thought that perhaps it would be best to begin by quoting Hermippus of Smyrna when he accused Pythagoras of doing and saying things and imitating and transferring to himself the opinions of the Jews. Interesting statement. Now, when we get to second Zechariah, or Hellenic Zechariah, Messianic Zechariah, three chapters which I have chosen to refer to by that name, we will read a statement in chapter 9 where after describing the path of Alexander the Great in Palestine and then considering the humility of the coming Messiah, 
the Lord goes on to make a statement through the prophet, quote, I will raise up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece. Who are the sons of Greece? Well, we'll consider them in a little more detail in following programs, but certainly Pythagoras is one, Socrates another, Plano, Aristotle, Xenophon, and Zeno. These are the sons of Greece and the thinkers of Greece. By the way, the Catholic Church was smart enough to recognize the danger and damage that Aristotle has done to the church. Well, who are the sons of Zion? They certainly include Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Jesus the Christ, and Paul. These are the sons of Zion. Now, one of the most important Greek philosophers was Pythagoras, a very mysterious figure. Now, if you've ever studied geometry in school, and when I was a boy, we had to, to have several years of geometry, and we had to study and memorize a lot of propositions and theorems made, done by Euclid. And today in America, they don't waste time doing that, but then it was regarded as good fodder for the brain. And if you studied it, you finally came to a proposition called the Pons Asinorum, which translated from the Latin means the bridge of asses. And this was the geometrical proposition that separated the boys and the men, the dummies in school from the smarter kids. The Pons Asinorum, a bridge of the asses, was the proposition that the square on the hypotenuse of a right triangle was equal to the sum of the squares on the other two sides. Well, who came up with this idea? Pythagoras came up with it. And I wish it was all he'd come up with, because he came up with a lot of other ideas that have been very destructive to Western civilization. But let's consider the answer from this Jewish rabbi, Yeshua Sherpin, when he was asked the question about Jewish philosophy and its impact on the Greeks. And what did Yeshua Sherpin say? He said, yes, Greek philosophy was impacted by Judaism and not vice versa. 55 years, it's a long time. That's how long world missionary evangelism has been taking care of children. It started with just a few little orphans in India and has grown to touch thousands over the last five decades. But what does child sponsorship mean? Well, child sponsorship means that someone just like you is providing food, clothing, medical care, an education, and in many cases, a home in which to live for children who have no one to turn to. Imagine for a second growing up on the streets. Imagine for a second being all alone at the age of four or five. Imagine what it's like just to survive. Those we don't help often die. Some are sold into slavery, a problem that still exists in the world today. Yet through child sponsorship, there's a bridge built, a bridge from nightmares to dreams, an opportunity for those dreams to be realized through education, an opportunity for that child who had no future now to be blessed with a future that lifts others up as you lifted him up. Child sponsorship is a very important part of World Missionary Evangelism's work. It's such an important part that it's really the heart of our mission, reaching out, saving lives. There are so many children right now who need to be sponsored. And if you were to step forward and just take one of them under your care, you would have the opportunity to get to know this child. And you would have the knowledge in your heart and in your soul that this child felt Christ's love through your donations and gifts. Why don't you pray about and think about sponsoring a child today? Rabbi, the rabbi goes on to say that perhaps I should quote Cleacus of Soli, who related the following from an encounter between Aristotle and a certain Jew. Quote, he conversed with us and other philosophical persons and made a trial of our skill in philosophy. And as he lived with many learned men, he communicated more information than he received from us. Then says the rabbi that there is the evidence of, Ju of Jewish impact on many other advancements for which the Greeks are renowned, such as their alphabet and their architecture. And the rabbi goes on to say, and I thought this was curious, that much has been made of the architectural acuity of the Greeks, especially the Greek columns with the aeolic and ionic capitals, 
as examples of Greek creativity. However, there is hardly a mention of Israelite architects who first incorporated centuries early. The now famous motive of a pair of scrolls spiraling out from a triangle into the capital of a column. Now these facts lead us to the glaring question of why do we not hear more about this? Why, for example, do historians who rely so heavily on Josephus barely make a mention of his account of the Jewish influence on Greek civilization? The rabbi asks whether there is some truth to what Josephus writes, that this is, quote, because they envied us or for some other unjustifiable reason. And the rabbi answers his own question and says, perhaps, but for some reason I get the feeling that there is more to it than just that. Sitting and pondering these thoughts while scanning the title lines of the bookshelves for something that might help, a thought suddenly hit me. I've been going about this all wrong. The answer is not to be found in some book of philosophy, ancient or modern. Rather, it is sitting right in front of me in the form of my Hanukkah candelabra. For isn't the story of Hanukkah really about a battle between Greek and Jewish philosophers with the Jews being Victoria? victorious? My own comment is, yes, it is. It's a spiritual issue. The rabbi asks, quote, but when we walk down the streets on any day, can one not still see signs of this victory? And he's implying, yes, we see signs of the victory when we see churches, temples, synagogues in our streets. Well, the rabbi comments, Hanukkah is really about a battle between Greek and Jewish philosophies. And he goes on to say, while there are many different and often opposing schools of thought in Greek philosophy, what they all had in common was their focus on the role of logic, inquiry, and reason, and the supremacy of the human intellect. Now, this is not only true of Greek philosophy, but of almost all Western philosophies, which are extensions of Greek philosophy. We exalt the human mind. And even if we would be exaggerating by saying, as Alfred Whitehead did, that Western philosophy is nothing more than a series of footnotes to Plato, it is not a stretch to say it is a whole that has been shaped by the Greeks. Our thinking in modern America has been shaped for us by the Greeks. And the rabbi goes on to say that this brings us back to the story of Hanukkah saying, at the time of the Hanukkah story, the enlightening Hellenistic culture was spreading throughout civilization. It influenced a large percentage of the Jewish population and led them to forsake their faith for rationalism exchanging the supernatural for the natural and the spiritual for the physical. The story of Hanukkah is not only about a physical revolt of the Jews against their Greek oppressors, it is the story of the revolt of the faith from the place it was assigned as the domain of the gullible and the uneducated. That's what the Greeks and modern leaders think of us, we're gullible and uneducated, do tell. In other words, the rabbi was saying, faith has been made the domain of the ignorant, the gullible, and the uneducated by the big thinkers of the world. But Hanukkah is the revolt of faith against philosophy. It is about the triumph of the supernatural over the natural, the triumph of the spiritual over the physical. And well over 2,000 years later, aren't signs of the triumph of faith not apparent even though Western civilization and the philosophers still thrive? Or what the rabbi is saying relates to the teachings of Jesus, to the prophet Habakkuk, to Zechariah, to Micah, and to Hosea. This is very important and current stuff, and if we can't get our heads out of the TV and out of following the thinking of highly questionable characters from Hollywood, and I might say Washington, D.C., who try to captivate our attention with their battles and their messages. If we can't get our heads higher than this, then we are going to pay a price for having our heads in the clouds that have no substance. And the rabbi goes on to say that many still put their faith in reason and the physical, 
But when we walk down the street, drive a car, ride the subway, do we not see and hear the expressions of faith and belief all around us? Do we not see many institutions dedicated to the faith, to faith and the spiritual rather than the physical? And if Western civilization is but a footnote to Plato, is it not equally true to say that the aforementioned expressions of faith in God and belief in the spiritual are in large parts thanks to Judaism and its faith in the one creator. Now I realize that in teaching on Zechariah, I'm going down a dangerous path. So many preachers nowadays are talking at the level where people live. I think it was Billy Graham that said he had to put his messages at the mental age of an eight-year-old for people to get them. Now, is that where we want to live and dwell and have our being? Do we want to remain children and act as a child, think as a child, behave as a child, or do we want to grow up? Do we appreciate mature messages and mature subject matter, or would you rather that your pe preacher jump and shout and scream and throw himself around and froth at the mouth and carry on if that is what you want? then I'm quite sure we can arrange it for you. But after it's all over, it's all sound and noise and nonsense and means nothing. What you need is a word that will deliver you from the grip of this world and people telling you what you should think and turn you to the words of Jesus and eternal life. When many think of world missionary evangelism, they think of us as an organization that provides meals for the hungry. We do that. But in many cases, this is just the beginning. We also provide farm animals for families. Why? Because this allows us to give them something that can help them win the battle of hunger each and every day. A farm animal, such as a chicken, a hog, milk goats, a milk cow, or a water buffalo, can feed a family by providing eggs, milk, cheese, and other products. They can also serve as a source of income for selling food and offspring at local markets. If you would like to be involved in this life-saving ministry, why don't you call us at 1-800-501-2851.